invite you to take your pew Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. It's found on page 797 of your pew Bible. And having found it, I'm going to invite you to stand and let's, let's read this scripture together. It's also found in Mark chapter, uh, Mark chapter 7, uh, almost the same story, but it's, I, I want to note that this rather interesting, challenging story from the life of Jesus is told not just once, but twice in the Bible. So reading, it's under the heading, The Canaanite Woman's Faith, down at the bottom of page 7. Nine, seven. I think it's also on the screen for our um, YouTube and Zoom uh, participants. Let's read together. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. <clears throat> but he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. We give thanks for this story of Scripture, what we learn from it, and the directions in which it uh, shapes us. Amen. Lord, as we read this scripture, this scripture as recorded for us, both in Mark and in Matthew, we recognize that there's some tension here. So, hey, that doesn't sound a lot like the Jesus we have come to worship. Help us to sit with that tension not push it away, and not too quickly explain it away. Help us hear the scripture as it comes to us down the ages and meets us in our time and our place. Amen. Well, good morning again all. It's Always good to welcome you, whether in person or uh, via live stream or Zoom. And thank you to all who make that technological endeavor possible. Uh, it, it's not an easy thing. It's an important thing, and your work is greatly appreciated. During Women's History Month, I'm preaching a series of sermons entitled The Women who taught Jesus, began last Sunday lifting up Mary, his mother. Next week, we'll look at the woman with the alabaster jar. And then we'll look at the sisters, Mary and Martha. Why does this sermon series matter? Why is it important that we recognize that there are women that taught Jesus 
and by extension, that Jesus lived among us as, yes, as a teacher, but also as a learner, as a student. Well, the Jesus we follow, the Jesus in our heart, the Jesus in our head, the Jesus we imagine, and the Jesus we remember, that Jesus shapes the way we follow. If that Jesus dropped from heaven, pre-programmed, complete in every way, somewhat robotic, predestined, simply doing what had been downloaded into him, rather inflexible, unfeeling, well then, the way we follow Jesus tends to be rather robotic, unthinking, insensitive, never changing, never learning, never growing. And I would submit, I would submit that we want to be and that the world is better off if we are followers of Jesus who are learning, growing, taking risks, Making mistakes, not equating making mistakes with sin. Okay? That's, there's a difference there. Simply getting things wrong is not a sin in and of itself. Sin is willful disobedience to God. The world, ourselves, our communities, our families are better off if we are learning, growing, taking risks, making some mistakes, expanding, expanding our understanding of how to follow Jesus and always expanding our definition of who it is that Jesus would have us love. It's an expanding faith, not a static faith. It's a learning faith, not a robotic faith. It's important to keep in mind as we come to this morning's scripture in Mark, the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman, in Matthew, Jesus and the Canaanite woman. Scholarship tells us that Mark was the first of the gospel writers used the very much more precise phrase, Syrophoenician, somebody from outside the house of Israel. And Matthew tells us that she was a Canaanite woman, uh, less precise than Mark's, but the point is the same. She was an outsider. She was not from the house of Israel that the most observant uh, followers of Jesus and the most injured, uh, uh, observant Jews of Jesus' day would have regarded her as something as a, an outcast, a misfit, uh, clearly not among the faithful. Maybe Jesus, as an observant Jew himself, entered this dialogue with that understanding an incomplete understanding, one that needed to change, one that needed to grow. And in this exchange with this woman, Jesus' understanding of who it was he is here to minister to grew itself. Well, let's read a little more closely. Reading again, hearing again the story as told by Dr. Stephen Jones in his book, Learning Jesus. Many scholars have pointed to this interaction with the Syrophoenician woman as an example of Jesus' learning. The woman came to him, <clears throat> excuse me, 
begging for mercy for her daughter. But the text tells us, but Jesus did not answer her at all. He explained his disinterest. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. An important vision and an important mission to be sure, but ultimately an incomplete understanding of his mission. Ultimately, an incomplete vision. With her, <clears throat> he called Gentiles dogs, which under any circumstance was derogatory. We would not expect this of Jesus. And instead of his leading the conversation, the woman took the initiative and opened his eyes to her faith, which up to that point he could not recognize. Only after this change of perspective was he able to respond to the woman with tenderness and healing love. In this story, the woman essentially does not change. She comes to Jesus on faith and demands a response based on her trust in him. The one who changes is Jesus, who begins unresponsive, then unsympathetic, then sarcastic at best, and only then responsive to the woman. She stays the same. It is Jesus who changes. One question to ask, why is this episode, episode included in two of the Gospels? It surely does not show Jesus at his best, but rather repeating prejudices and stereotypes of his day. And the teacher in this episode is not Jesus, but the Gentile woman. Does this not show a willingness on the part of the gospel writers to reveal the humanity of Jesus and his ability to change and learn when faced with new situations. Do we serve a pre-programmed Jesus or a learning, responding, growing Jesus? At heart, that's the question here. What kind of follower, what kind of Jesus do we follow? What kind of followers of Jesus will we be? And clearly, I am suggesting, I am urging that we, with Jesus, be learning, growing, expanding our understanding of God's love. Followers of Jesus. This Canaanite woman, according to Matthew, this Syrophoenician woman, according to Mark, demanded that Jesus see her. She demanded that Jesus hear her. She demanded that Jesus recognize her faith. In some ways, this, this woman is, is like, the, it's like the people of Ukraine in the modern world. Demanding that we see them. Demanding that we hear them. Demanding that we recognize their faith. That we not regard them as something as other, as outside our concern or the concerns of the globe. Their president, President Zelensky, spoke to Congress this week. Peace in your country, he said to Congress, peace in your country does not depend anymore, depend anymore only on you and your people. It depends on those next to you, on those who are strong. Strong does not mean big. Strong is brave and ready to fight for the life of citizens and citizens of the world. This woman was strong. 
when she felt that Jesus wasn't quite getting her, she stood her ground. And Jesus learned from her. We need to be careful. The Ukrainian people are not the only people in the world that need the attention of the United States of America as rich and powerful as we are. Where were we decades ago, the genocide in Rwanda? Not saying we don't pay attention to Ukraine, it's just we need to have a moral discussion about in a world of great pain, when there are countries like this woman saying, I have legitimate need, how do we respond to them as well? With great responsibility, with great power, with great wealth comes great responsibility. In this story, Jesus the learner had his understanding of his responsibility expand. Not just to the last sheep of the house of Israel. They still mattered. But also to the Syrophoenicians and the Canaanites. Outsiders that they were. One of the great stories from Scripture is Jesus asking his disciples, who do you say that I am? And we, we hear that as a theological question. And certainly Peter takes it as such. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. President Brenneman of the Berkeley School of Theology suggests that that question is, yes, a theological question, but also an existential question. I'm trying to figure this out. What am I here for? Who, who do you think I am? Almost an invitation to help me define and understand my mission, my vision, my purpose. Jesus as learner, Jesus as willing to expand his vision. Who do you stay that I am? Help me, help me think about this. I think the point is there. Jesus was a learner. Jesus was a student, and in many cases, it was women, strong, amazing women, who taught Jesus, his mother Mary. Today, this Syrophoenician woman, who insisted on being seen and heard and respected. We give thanks for Jesus, the teacher. Let's learn from him. We give thanks for Jesus, the student. Let's learn with him. Let's give thanks this Women's History Month for the women who taught Jesus. They had something to say then, and they have something to say now. Amen. Amen.